Without the ones like you, who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional grade industrial supplies. Count on real time product availability and fast delivery. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. History as it happens, April 18th, 2024. Trump against the founders. We will stop the steal. Let's have trial by combat. As we showed you last week, even President Trump's legal team, led by Rudy Giuliani, knew they had no actual evidence to demonstrate the election was stolen. We love Trump! We love Trump! We love Trump! They failed to attempt to obstruct the Congress. This failed insurrection only underscores how crucial the task before us is for our republic. Former President Trump says he is absolutely immune from criminal charges. He says he can't be prosecuted for official acts once he leaves office. And the U.S. Supreme Court will hear arguments in this case, as special counsel Jack Smith attempts to prosecute Trump for trying to overturn the 2020 election. Historians of the founding era say there's no plausible historical case for Trump's claim. That's next as we report history as it happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. The June 23rd, 1972 White House conversation is only one of many ordered released by the Supreme Court, but it is a crucial one for it occurred so soon after the Watergate break-in. In these folders that you see over here on my left, are more than 1,200 pages of transcripts of private conversations I participated in between September 15, 1972 and April 27 of 1973 with my principal aides and associates with regard to Watergate. In the debate about executive power, there's a ghost hanging over all discussions. The ghost at the banquet is monarchy, specifically George III. The president cannot function, and the presidency itself cannot retain its vital independence if the president faces criminal prosecution for official acts once he leaves office. These words are in a brief filed by Donald Trump's lawyers. The Supreme Court will hear arguments April 25th. And although we live in an age of overstatement, it is not overstatement to say this case strikes at the foundation of our republic, that the executive is not above the law, that he or she is not immune from criminal inquiry. Now, I'm no lawyer, and I don't play one on this podcast, but it's not that executive privilege should never be respected, and no one is arguing a president should be sued or prosecuted for doing his job, even if he does it very poorly but within the confines of the law. The question here is whether a former president is absolutely immune from criminal charges. But uh, I don't get the sense that Trump's legal team would agree with how I'm framing this. Here is his attorney and then Trump himself explaining what they mean. If we adopt what the special counsel wants, if we adopt what President Biden wants, then we open the Pandora's box to political prosecution after political prosecution after political prosecution. In fact, Joe Biden could be prosecuted for trying to stop this man from becoming the next president of the United States. We don't need political prosecutions. We need political process. I'd like to introduce President Trump. Well, I want to thank you all. And we had a, I thought, very momentous day in terms of what was learned and what they've conceded. They conceded two major points that were, uh, they were right in doing it. I don't think they had much of a choice, but they're very, very big, very powerful points. And I think we're doing very well. I think it's very unfair when a opponent, a political opponent, is prosecuted by the DOJ, by Biden's DOJ. Uh, so they're losing in every poll. They're losing in almost every demographic. Numbers came out today that are uh, really very mind-boggling if you happen to be Joe Biden. And I think they feel this is the way they're going to try and win. And that's not the way it goes. It'll be bedlam in the country. It's a very bad thing. It's a very bad 
precedent, as we said, it's the opening of a Pandora's box, and that's a very, that's a very sad thing that's happened with this whole situation. So again, the former president is saying he's being prosecuted for doing his job, official acts, and therefore he is absolutely immune from criminal charges. Well, in a brief filed by 15 historians of the founding era, they write, There is no plausible historical case supporting this claim. The Constitution does not expressly confer any presidential immunity, even though it does for members of Congress in limited cases. The court must discern whether that silence indicates that permanent presidential immunity was so integral as to need no description, as Trump contends, or whether it reflects an intention not to confer immunity. The historians go on to say, Sometimes history speaks ambiguously, but here it speaks with surpassing clarity. The principle that a president may be prosecuted, which informed President Nixon's 1974 pardon and President Clinton's 2001 plea bargain, began in the beginning. As James Iredell, one of this court's inaugural justices, explained, if the president commits any crime, he is punishable by the laws of his country. I will embed a link to the historian's brief in my weekly newsletter. You can sign up at historyasithappens.com or find History As It Happens on Substack. In a moment, we're going to speak to this man. The powers of the presidency are not defined by the document, the Constitution. They're defined by Washington's presidency, his two-term. And he does make it a powerful office capable of overseeing the government with some degree of authority in both foreign and domestic affairs. And then he sets the president. He steps down. And that is Joseph Ellis. The first conversation in this episode will be with Jack Rakove, one of the authors of the historian's amicus or amicus brief. They'll both take us back to the founding era to explain whether a president has immunity. Kings did, but the president? Anytime I have a chance to talk about the founders, I leap at it. I spend so much time in the recent past here, like, say, 1974, the U.S. versus Nixon. The Supreme Court ruled Richard Nixon had to obey a criminal subpoena and hand over his White House tapes in the Watergate investigation. The court held the president cannot shield himself from producing evidence in a criminal prosecution based on the doctrine of executive privilege. Although such privilege, the court said, is valid in other situations. And we know how all this turned out for Nixon. The Nixon presidency is virtually being overtaken by events tonight. One of Mr. Nixon's Senate leaders, Griffin of Michigan, and his chief House Judiciary Committee defender, Wiggins of California, both asked for his resignation. If you notice, the president says he's heard the tapes, or some of them, and they sustain his position. But he says he's not going to let anybody else hear them for fear they might draw a different conclusion. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Executive overreach may have been the founding generation's greatest fear. If not number one, it's right up there. And we all learned this in our first history classes as kids. You know, I can't name many British kings, but I do remember George III. Now, many legal experts don't expect Trump to win this case, but by agreeing to take it, the Supreme Court ensured that Trump's trial for the January 6th related allegations won't start until at least the fall, or depending on when and how the justices rule, maybe not until after the election. Joseph Ellis is a leading historian of the American founding and the Pulitzer Prize winning author of Founding Brothers. He'll be here in a bit. Historian and political scientist Jack Rakove has been teaching at Stanford since 1980. His 1996 book, Original Meanings, Politics and Ideas in the Making of the Constitution, won the Pulitzer Prize. Jack Rakove, welcome back. Happy to be here, Martin. When I was preparing to connect with you here, I thought of something you said to me in one of our recent or past conversations. He said, we're still living in the political framework that our founding fathers created in the late 18th century. So that's why we're always talking about them. And in this case, what they said about presidential or didn't say about presidential immunity, at least in the Constitution, is quite relevant to current events and the headlines. So uh, that really wasn't a question, but uh, I'll ask you a question. What role should historians play here in the public debate? Well, I think we should play uh, whatever role opens up for us. I mean, historians are not as well leveraged as lawyers to have expertise or be asked for their commentary. You know, we have a more, on the one hand, we have a more restricted body of knowledge 
Uh, it is primarily about the past, and we often have to catch up on the present. On the other hand, we have a perspective that a lot of scholars, including many highly qualified, you know, able attorneys who are certainly well versed uh, in all the legal issues, cannot readily provide. So uh, there are there are many occasions that arise when historical knowledge is is useful to help people see either the understand the origins of a question and origins here in 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 the deep sense of the term the origins of particular constitutional provisions or to understand the context within which contemporary events are unfolding or to have kind of angles of attack or perspectives that otherwise would not be available and a lot of very well educated lawyers are very smart people and I, I know and many things I've written, uh, if you don't rely on their expertise, you'll miss a lot of fundamental facts that you need to know to understand the current su- situation. But by you know, by the same token, many of them are historically, I won't say ignorant, but you know, they're not necessarily well informed historically. You know, when you go to law school, you know, you can come from any of a number of majors. In fact, it doesn't really matter what you major in to go to law school, so long as you've done well and you you do well on the LSATs or whatever. Yeah. And then you know, you're trained to think within a certain body of conventions. There's a lot of way in which legal reasoning is like. Uh, historical reasoning. And I have a lot of law school friends who think that history actually is a great major for prospective lawyers, but it's not necessary. I can take one example, Larry Tribe, you know, the very famous Harvard law professor, was a math major. Since you mentioned lawyers, I thought no one could argue with a straight face that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment didn't cover the office of the presidency. I am going back now to the uh, Colorado ballot case here before the Supreme Court. I spoke to Sean Wilentz and Mark Graber about that case on the podcast. But Trump's attorney did say that maybe Section 3 doesn't cover the office of the president. Uh, Officer of the United States, office under the United States. Just real briefly, before we get to the immunity case, the reason I have you here, how do you feel the justices dealt with the history of the 14th Amendment in the Colorado ballot case. I thought they kind of botched it, but, you know, no one's listening to me over here. Uh, well, you know, if they didn't botch it, they kind of circled around it or circled away from it or tried to avoid confronting it. I mean, I, I think all the historians who know the history, and including, you know, Mark and, and Sean, thought the court had deliberately, but, you know, quite carefully avoided tackling with the historical dimensions of the issue. I mean, you know, the argument the court seemed to move towards in its decision was that You actually need congressional legislation to implement the disqualification provisions of Section 3. It's true that Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, like Section 2 of the 13th Amendment and Section 2 of the 15th Amendment, authorized Congress to enact enabling legislation. But no one at the time would have thought that without that additional congressional legislation, that the cause was effectively silent or, you know, was inert and needed something more. I mean, the additional legislation would be to not to empower the legal action to go forward, but to provide additional mechanisms. Uh, you know, I talked about this, you know, again, a number of my friends at the Legal Academy who just felt the court would be extremely reluctant to do anything that would circumvent the legitimacy or whatever of a presidential election. Yeah, I, I was know. expecting the ruling that came, uh, although... Maybe not nine zero, but I I was disappointed in how they dealt with the history there. Yeah, they didn't deal with it directly. Yeah, the, the, the court doesn't want to deal with the the history. They often duck it. I mean, I felt that was true in the the Moore versus Harper case. There was the North Carolina gerrymandering case, which is linked with the so called independent state legislature theory, where the court went out of its way to avoid reading the actual discussion of the election clause, Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution, it went out of its way to avoid dealing with uh, what strikes me as the plain meaning of the debate in the federal convention as to why the elections clause was added to the Constitution. <laughs> if you take that debate seriously, it kind of blows the, it blew that argument out of the water. You know, to, to raise a more general point, there are modes of legal argument which are simply driven by textualist considerations. For a historian, you can never understand a text without knowing the context. That's what we do. You know, that's our job is to provide the context. But, you know, the court is not constrained or obliged uh, from an historian's vantage point to deal with the context. It doesn't always have to provide or consider the political history that underlies any particular provision. If it wants to do it on a, on a textual basis, you know, if it wants to say, no, the president is not, you know, a civil officer of the United States or whatever, he's not an <laughs> officer of the United States. I mean, the text, you know, if it's just read by itself, could, in, you know, in a perverse but plausible sense, support 
or at least be amenable to that interpretation. Mark Graber said it best on my show about the usefulness of originalism or textualism. It's best where it's needed least. For instance, uh, every state gets two senators. So there, I'm an originalist now. All right, uh, immunity, presidential immunity. So when I started hearing about this and started preparing for this, I wasn't thinking about the 18th century and, you know, those lessons we get when we're in elementary school about the founders and how their aversion to monarchy. I was thinking, wait a second. 1974, Richard Nixon. Didn't we handle this already? Well, I, you know, I think I think the proper answer to that question is overdetermined. I mean, the, you cannot make a plausible case for explaining why the president would be immune, or more to the point, why an ex-president would be immune to criminal prosecution, just on some abstract notion that if he wasn't immune from legal prosecution, he would be so constrained in his uh, executive decisions as to be wholly ineffective. As a president, I mean, you know, I think all of us, I mean, all the historians who worked on the brief, you know, the Brennan Center calls it's a historian's council, of which I'm a proud and happy member. You know, we all thought the argument was, you know, ab initio absurd. Or you could say ad absurdum (laughs) ab initio. Yeah, I did a control F word search for Nixon and I did not find his name in there. So, yeah, it's all about the Constitution. You know, I said the question, why would Gerald Ford have had a part of Nixon? For his own political purposes, if Nixon had, you know, was properly immune from prosecution. So, yeah, you know, so the argument made no sense, but because the claim has been made, you know, on what, however specious the premise is, and, you know, we'll see, we'll see how the court deals with it. The historians, you know, Philly the Brennan Center felt we ought to have some kind of answer that, again, would set the context, would explain what seems to us to be an obvious fact or an obvious judgment, but would provide the context for understanding why that judgment should be obvious. So what does the U.S. Constitution say about presidential immunity? Well, I think the key thing comes out of the impeachment clause. The verdict rendered by impeachment, per se, and impeachment and conviction. Remember, impeachment is just the equivalent of indictment, so you need a trial to reach a judgment or a verdict. So the only penalty that comes from being impeached and convicted, impeached by the House and convicted by the Senate, will be an exclusion from office, you know, both at the present but also conceivably in the future, uh, which, of course, is you know, in many ways what was at stake, particularly in the second Trump impeachment. So it follows, therefore, that you know, impeachment is primarily a political decision and not a legal one in the strict or constrained sense of the term. That's to say the legal responsibility that we associate with being prosecuted in front of a jury or whatever, that's a, that's a separate process. You know, so impeachment is essentially a political decision about the well-being of the republic. A subsequent criminal trial is about the, mo- the moral and legal responsibility of the perpetrator. So other than the impeachment judgment clause that you just referred to, the Constitution doesn't really say anything. It doesn't mention presidential immunity. So how can anyone infer that it exists? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's exactly Hire right. Hire a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, that's I, well, Martin, was, it, was that a rhetorical question? <laughs> In effect, you know. But uh, this yeah. idea that a president can be prosecuted, this goes really all the way back to the beginning. Well, as Madison says in, uh, I think it's in Federalist 51, no man can be a judge in his own case. <laughs> so you assume when wrongdoing is alleged, you know, he or she has to be subject to the normal legal processes. You know, Bart, I have a different way to think about this question, you know, if you don't mind. So I, when I think about the question of the authority of the president to act outside or in defiance of strict legal obligations and responsibilities, uh, what I think about is John Locke's chapter on what's called prerogative, the prerogative powers of uh, of government, his second treatise of government, which was written probably in the early 1680s and published in 1689. And Locke says, in, instead of using, relying on the traditional British understanding of prerogative, which was, in a sense, had a historical and specifically constitutional character, Locke argued, and what I think is really a brilliant chapter, that in every government, there must be some inherent power under certain circumstances to act outside the law or even against it. The example he gives is the city is burning down. And to save the city, you may have to just start tearing down people's you know, houses, destroying their property in order to serve a collective good. So situations may arise that no one can anticipate, but where for the public health and safety, the executive official you know, the crown, American president, whatever, 
may simply out of necessity or emergency have to act outside or even against the law. And, you know, most commentators on that chapter dwell particularly on that passage. But Locke went on to make two further observations, which, which I think are really quite brilliant. The first one says, and I think in a certain sense, this is juxtaposing the citizenry against the lawyers. He said, is that in fact, when the executive acts, when government acts out of necessity, if its motives are proper, you know, or, you know, recognizable, the circumstances are so apparent that everyone understands that the cost of not acting would far exceed the cost of acting. The body politic will understand. Again, I say, you know, the lawyers might be fussy about this, you know, because they always reason within legal categories. And so if the law is there, they're going to be very nervous about making that claim. But the citizenry, the polity in general, will support the decision. That's Locke's second big point in this chapter. And the third point uh, that Locke makes is, nevertheless, because Locke wants to maintain a theory of legislative supremacy, the legislative branch, which is, you know, which is should be the dominant power from Locke's point of view in any government, always has the authority to, you know, amend the rules to circumstrain the abuse of prerogative power. It, it, it can never totally destroy it because necessity may justify it, but it can always seek to regulate it. So you might be able to make some kind of claim that under certain circumstances, whatever the Constitution says, at uh, some kind of moment of urgent decision, the president has to use his or her best judgment to protect the body politic of the republic and society more generally. If it's for the right motive, it'll be acceptable. For the wrong motive, then he or she should be culpable. The problem as it relates to Trump is that the immunity claim relates to the conduct of an election and an and activity over which the president, or for that matter, the vice president, uh, has any legal authority or responsibility. I mean, we have a highly decentralized electoral system. It's primarily based in state law, subject to federal review under, you know, a whole variety of criteria, depending on a whole array of circumstances. And, you know, congressional statutes, constitutional amendments, existing practices, and so on and so on. But the president has no responsibility there. So the idea he has an obligation or let's say an opportunity to act outside or even against the law, as it seems to be stated, just because he's president, when it's not part of his one of his duly authorized activities just makes no sense. Yeah, the president has no role in the electoral process of his office. Uh, although, to be fair, Trump did say it's up to Vice President Pence to send the votes back. For that. Well, but that's, but that's um, the same yeah. thing. I no, mean, I know. They're, it's they're ridiculous. Involved. I was yeah, yeah, making yeah. a bad joke oh, there. Oh, oh, you know? oh, oh, you're just kidding around here. <laughs> and Mike Pence is going to have to come through for us. And if he doesn't, that will be a, a sad day for our country because... You're sworn to uphold our Constitution. I await Justice Alito uh, quoting John Locke, as you have so eloquently here uh, on the April 25th hearing. But, well, actually, no. I, got, I encouraged RBG, and she did it to do it in the Arizona redistricting case, for, for which I wrote an amicus curiae brief. And I made a strong, a different Lockean argument there, and she picked up on it. Excellent. So the brief says, the brief that you contributed to the Brennan Center, uh, the framers were acutely aware that every prior republic from Rome to the English Commonwealth had failed due to executive overreach. So as I mentioned at the top of the podcast, we kind of all learned these history lessons in elementary school about monarchy and such. How did the founders, that generation, how did their experience with monarchy and knowledge of British royal history inform their views about presidential immunity in the new American Republic? Marty, I think the basic point to be made, the most important and also in some, to some extent difficult problem in Anglo-American constitutional thinking. In the 17th century, you know, when the Stuarts were still on the British throne, the English slash British throne, uh, and then in the 18th century, was how do you constrain executive power? How do you turn the somewhat absolutist claims of the Stuart monarchy, you know, which, you know, for extended periods, tried to rule without parliament at all? You know, how do you create a recognizably constitutional monarchy in which the ability of the executive to act unilaterally without soliciting parliamentary consent in one form or other was really the dominant concern of that entire era? I mean, there are other concerns as well, but that was that's the preeminent one. Uh, and the colonists, the American colonists in the 18th century, the guys who become our revolutionaries and, and our founders and 
in our framers and so on, were the heirs to that deeper tradition of, of English thinking. And there were a number of issues in 18th century colonial politics, before you get to the revolution proper, before you get to the 1760s, where the difference between executive, the power of the crown, as it was wielded in the American colonies versus the way in which it had been constrained back in the realm of the United Kingdom. The Americans were highly conscious of those differences. Uh, and that's one reason why when they started writing constitutions in 1776, primarily at the state level of government, the executive was effectively deprived of most of its independent political authority, or to use the language of John Adams, when stripped of those badges of domination called prerogative. So in effect, the Americans, the American revolutionaries, or the first generation of American constitutionalists, the 1776 crowd, the guys who wrote the first state constitutions, you know, like George Mason, you know, they were concerned in many ways with uh, reducing executive power to its literal definition, the authority to carry out, to execute what someone else had decided. So the legislature was the dominant branch of government, and the executive was thought of as being a responsible office holder who had to implement whatever the legislature decided. Now, 11 years later, when Madison looks, well, actually, even less than that, in 1785, Madison starts writing about this. Madison, looking back on this, says, look, back in 1776, and he was part of the committee that wrote the first Virginia Constitution in 1776. Madison says, look, back at the time, we were preoccupied with our prior grievances against the abuse of executive, the administration, meaning the executive branch of government, and we weren't sufficiently attentive to the needs of how do you design well-constructed legislatures? So Madison, in terms of his agenda for 1787, you know, for the Constitutional Convention, Madison was much more sensitive to the, the need to kind of think about how do you improve the quality of legislation, legislative determination and decision-making. And was at that point was more interested in saying, what, what should we do now perhaps to enhance executive authority somewhat? I mean, not radically. So there's a kind of historical arc that the American revolutionary and constitutionalist embarked on in 1776 and came back and revisited in 1787, 1788. But, you know, but, you know the dominant impulse at the beginning was to constitutionalize the executive power, you know, to make it subject to all kinds of constraints. Most of the governors served only annual terms. They're elected by the legislature. They were, with a couple of exceptions, deprived of the veto power over legislation. That's one of the powers the colonists had really resented back before 1765 or before 1776. Well, Trump's lawyers are saying presidential immunity is rooted in the common law. So page 29 of this 48-page brief, the change in the common law of executive privilege is most clearly articulated in the first Americanized edition of Blackstone's Commentaries on the Laws of England, 1765 to 69, an essential source for early American jurists. St. George Tucker, one of the most prominent jurists and legal scholars in the new United States, recognized the need to update the treatise to reflect the ways American common law rejected the British system's hierarchies. I guess this is a long way of saying, how can anyone, well, they would fail, they would fail a first grade social studies test. You know, we, we do have today, Jack, and I'll stop talking in a second here. We do have this thing today. Uh, remember with the Mueller report stuff, a sitting president, this is Justice Department guidance, sitting president can't be indicted. But Donald Trump is... He's not a sitting president anymore. You know, the additional criterion that arises to justify a criminal indictment, uh, or for that matter, even the second impeachment, the trial would have gone on after Trump had left office. There are two main punishments that come out of impeachment, being convicted of impeachment. Uh, one is to be excluded from an office you're occupying. The other is to be prevented from holding it again. They are equally valuable. And this is where I think, you know, Judge Ludwig, Michael Ludwig, you know, has received a lot of credit on the whole from the left, although he's, you know, he's well known as a kind of very serious, eminent conservative judge and in a lot of ways has been very valuable and helpful. But he made the argument, which the Republicans of the Senate jumped all over, saying that, well, once he had left office, the impeachment trial had, in a sense, become a redundant or superfluous activity. And I, I just think historically he's wrong because you, you have the second goal of public policy. I mean, suppose information became available uh, after uh, January 20th, 2021, about Trump's complicity. Let's say we finally found out what Putin said to him when they met at Helsinki or whatever. You know, if information becomes available after he's left office, 
why would you not want to proceed yeah. either with an impeachment or a criminal inquiry, depending on the nature of the activity? Yeah, man, uh, this doesn't mean Trump should have been indicted or should be convicted. It means he doesn't have immunity, you know, blanket right. immunity yeah, right. so, from this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I don't have a fixed position. I mean, the authority for the idea that a sitting president cannot be indicted comes primarily from, you know, this famous OLC memorandum. Which, as I understand, I think primarily from Rachel Maddow, who's the one who's worked on this. Oh, yeah. was you know, was actually a byproduct of the concern about Spiro Agnew, <laughs> when Agnew was on the verge of impeachment renewal, and DOJ lawyers started to think about the implications of this. It's not as if Americans, in general, or you know, concerned decision makers in Congress in particular, have really have directly addressed and thought about you know what is it to say that a president should be immune. From prosecution, I mean, you have to say it about a king because that's the nature of monarchy. You know, I mean, you could make a federalism argument, and this, you know, this is the kind of thing the court, in some ways, may have been concerned with in the Colorado case, that what's to stop rogue prosecutors, you know, in individual states from harassing the federal presidency? You know, maybe you can make some kind of supremacy clause argument or whatever. You know, the problems that it would create are certainly you know, non-trivial and have to be addressed. On the other hand, the idea that this whole attitude depends upon a memorandum, no matter how, how well-researched it was, seems, you know, to my somewhat primitive way of thinking to be an inadequate foundation for what is admittedly a difficult and controversial question. Hey, you don't want the pendulum to swing too far in the other direction, as you said, but for something like this, January 6th, I mean, that's, that was a pretty serious yeah, right, offense. Right. Uh, and again, right. the legal system will sort that out. The issue is whether Trump should have immunity. You know that uh, you obviously know this. Uh, Thomas Jefferson tried to claim privilege in 1807 to get out of providing evidence in the trial of Aaron Burr who, uh, right. rumor has it, shot someone who was pretty famous while Burr was vice president. And uh, Chief Justice Marshall told Jefferson, sorry, you can't do that. You don't have that privilege under the Constitution. I'm looking at this from an even broader perspective. We're living in the era of the imperial presidency. Uh, to me, the executive branch has accumulated way too much power, especially in foreign policy. You'll remember the War Powers Act passed after Nixon's abuses in Cambodia. It's never been successfully invoked. Uh, and there are folks out there who believe in something called the unitary executive, or as Nixon put it, if the president does it, it is not illegal. Well, when the president does it, that means that it is not illegal, by definition. Exactly. If the Supreme Court goes this step further, that a president has immunity, essentially we no longer have a constitution. Am I overwrought here? Martin, it's, it's fine to be overwrought. I mean, the problem is this question falls on what I call the, the muy complicado you know, side of the equation. There's, I mean, there, there are a lot of issues at stake here. I mean, take the war powers resolution. Well, it, it's, hard, it's hard to overcome presidential judgments in you know, the realm of that kind, in the realm of defense and, and national security. But the reason is, uh, and I think it goes back to things the framers of the Constitution were worried with, you know, when you have to act in that realm, it's hard to get bilateral consent, you know, particularly when you're dealing with kind of low-level and intermediate threats. You know, so it's whether the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor if you want to declare war, because declaring war has all kinds of, you know, in addition to creating a, a particular relationship with our opponents, it has all kinds of legal implications, you know, for how the government's going to operate in wartime, which are not necessarily true in peace. You know, I think the War Powers Resolution in some ways works well in the sense that, A, presidents generally comply with it, and B, it, it deals with the fact that Congress is incompetent to act on the, on the kind of, is often we incompetent to act with the urgency that those kinds of situations often discovers. You know, the imperial presidency was a popular phrase when I was in graduate school, I mean, back in the 1970s. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm not sure how well it operates today. I mean, there, I think, are enough new dimensions to the use of presidential power that I think require a different kind of model. I'm not sure what it is, but I have made an argument in other contexts. I particularly talk about whether we should have a national popular vote to elect the president. That I, I think there's been a delegitimation of presidential power uh, for the last 30 years. I mean, delegitimation in the sense that for very different reasons, the idea that ever since Bill Clinton, that the person living at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue was there properly, legitimately, and so on. It's come under question. I mean, I think with Clinton, I think Republicans thought hard to release the idea that they had a lock on the presidency when Clinton proved that they didn't. 
they got involved in this long running campaign, which began with the, those crazy New York Times articles, you know, about the Whitewater scandal, which nobody could ever quite figure out what it was. And then finally ended with Monica Lewinsky and so on. And then, you know, with, I think with Bush, you have the Bush v. Gore issue, the, with the Supreme Court acting properly. Uh, with Obama, the racist animosities that beat so strongly still in American society, particularly among Republicans, were released, of course, with Donald Trump. You know, he had a guy who, who violates many of the basic norms of political behavior, but also, you know, was three million votes behind Hillary Clinton in uh, you know 2016 and 7 million votes behind George Bush. And then, of course, you have the, you know, let's go branded stuff. Uh, I think you meant Joe Biden, 7 million behind Biden. Maybe we have the same problems Trump has because I'm, you know, because Trump and I are pretty close in age. I think I'm somewhat more lucid and I know I'm not <laughs> under indictment. <laughs> but yeah. uh, but you're case. saying that, well, I mean, I don't know, the impeachment tool, That I mean, that's broken. I mean, every president... Pretty much every president has faced, if not impeachment, an impeachment inquiry or public calls for impeachment. It's not a very effective tool at reining in a rogue executive. Well, Martin, I have an article right in front of me. Oh, boy. Oh, the computer screen that just came out that I wrote called Impeachment, Responsibility and Constitutional Failure from Watergate to January 6th. I mean, the impeachment clause has now become a fruitless part of the Constitution. But, I, you know, I think that's primarily... Be- because of the nation of the Republican Party. Uh, to my way of thinking, the independent variable in American politics is the Republican Party. Until we finally know where, how it's going to come out. I mean, it's generated into an authoritarian cult for a whole variety of reasons. And, you know, until we know what becomes of it, our politics is going to be highly unstable. Mike Pence, I hope you're going to stand up for the good of our Constitution and for the good of of our country. And if you're not, I'm going to be very disappointed in you. I will tell you right now. So, Jack Raycove, since you mentioned Spiro Agnew, who is the only other vice president to quit? Oh, my God. Who was the only other vice president to quit, to resign office? I know I know that Madison killed off, too. <laughs> <laughs> he, killed off, he killed off George Clinton, and then he killed off Albert Gary, who was speaking figuratively. I don't know. You know, I'm not, you know, there's some trivia questions I'm not so good at. So you John you C. Here? Calhoun. Oh, Calhoun. Yeah. He, yeah. he hated Andrew Jackson. He, he was his vice president, and he quit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That must have been an unhappy relationship. <laughs> Yes. You know, of course, yeah, Jackson was not a big fan of nullification theory either. So. Great book written about that by uh, William W. Freeling uh, about the... Uh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. He wrote a book about the nullification crisis. It's back on the shelf behind me. <laughs> yeah. Joseph Ellis, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, Martin DeCardo, hello. Glad to be back with you. <laughs> yes. Uh, we've got a lot to discuss today. However, I think on behalf of everyone listening, how are you? How's life? What have you been up to? I'm up here in Vermont, middle of Vermont, on top of a mountain. We get a lot of snow up here, uh, a lot of rain recently. But I'm putting the finishing touches on a book that will come out with Random House next fall, probably, called... Um, realities and regrets the tragic side of the american founding i hope it's as good as i wanted to make it but i'm up here in other words every day four to six hours pretending to live in the 18th century (laughs) you live in the past but in a good way Uh, i you know the founders are dead and gone but i talk to them on a daily basis on namely through their correspondence and when lawyers talk about you know i'm a believer in original intent most of the time they have no idea what the 18th century original intent means. but um, And in this particular case, that actually has some bearing. But um, yeah, let's get on with it, though, because we're facing an inflection moment in American history. I've heard that. This election, in my judgment, the November election, will be the most important of my lifetime. But looking back as a historian, I think it's perhaps the second most important presidential election in American history. Wow. The most Important is 1860. You know, 1864 is also important because, as it's been pointed out to me, if Abraham Lincoln did not win that election, there would not have been a 13th Amendment. It, that's worth a dialogue, but yes, I, you're making some sense. That's true. But let's get on. All elections are important, but I agree. This one is important for the reasons we're about to discuss here. I just want to ask one other quick question about the book. How many will this be now? How many books? 
13. Well, I'm 13 behind you. Time to start. <laughs> All right. So presidential immunity. Donald Trump and his attorney say they have absolute immunity against criminal prosecution, even though he's not president anymore, for what happened on January 6th and, uh, well, anything really that he's been involved in. That is not to say that he should be indicted or charged or convicted of what happened on January 6th. The issue is whether he has immunity from all that. What does the Constitution say about presidential immunity? It doesn't say anything specific. The debate over executive power in Philadelphia from May to September of 1787 is difficult to follow. And there's a reason for that. And the historical context is crucial. In the debate about executive power, there's a ghost hanging over all discussions. The ghost at the banquet is monarchy, specifically George III. There are two founding documents, two founding moments. 1776, the document is the Declaration of Independence. 1787, the document is the Constitution. The debate over the Constitution is very much influenced by the earlier debate about American independence. If you read, and Jefferson writes, the final two-thirds of that document, it's a prosecution of George III and a statement that the United States intends to be a republic, not a monarchy, and that all monarchs are, by definition, not permitted. That affects the discussion in Philadelphia in 1787. It's difficult to follow. This is the most studied document in American history. And historians have written tons of stuff about it. The problem that the founders faced is on the one hand, they want the new executive to have sufficient authority to govern a large republic. On the other hand, and this is the biggie for our point here, they are worried that any executive that's given unlimited power will become a monarch or what we would call a dictator. That's the one thing they seek to avoid. While this debate is occurring, there's one man sitting in the chair and his name is George Washington. And they all know that no matter what they decide about the powers of the presidency, that Washington's going to be the first president. And the reason that he is an easy, obvious, self-evident choice is that he has demonstrated in a very graphic way that he can be trusted with power because he will, he is an aficionado of exits. At the end of the war, he surrenders his sword and his commission to the Congress and walks away. He can be trusted, but then what happens after Washington? And therefore, the debate is difficult to follow because they want to find a way to assure an executive that has some degree of authority, but make sure that that authority is not unlimited. In the subsequent debate in the first Congress, the vice president, John Adams, tries to say that we ought to, what do you call the president? How do we address him? And eventually they decide the president. Um, then people say, that's right. All he should do is preside. And Adams says, we've got to call him something more than that, like his excellency or something noble. And he is laughed off the stage. And the people say, we're going to call you his rotundity from now on. Um, <laughs> not profundity. but yeah. Not profundity at all. It's a bad moment for Adams, um, who's one of my favorite founders. But my point here is that the issue facing the Supreme Court here should be very clear and easy to resolve. While the powers of the presidency as declared in the Constitution are not clear, and I would argue that the powers of the presidency are not defined in Article Two of the Constitution. You go back and read Article Two in the Constitution, you tell me what a president can do. It's very difficult for the very reasons I've explained. The powers of the presidency are not defined by the document, the Constitution. They're defined by Washington's presidency, his two-term. And he does make it a powerful office capable of 
overseeing the government with some degree of authority in both foreign and domestic affairs. And then he sets the president. He steps down. He could have stayed on forever, but then he would have been a king. And that's the last thing he wanted to do. By the way, he wanted to get back to Mount Vernon from uh, yeah. more than anybody you can possibly imagine. In this current context, Martin, the decision made by the lower court in response to the Trump team's claim of immunity was clearly written and rooted in the history and the law as most sensible people would see it. What's difficult to fathom for me is why the Supreme Court didn't simply endorse that judgment. And the net effect of their policy or their decision was to defer this decision. And then we won't find out what the verdict is in probably until June. Yeah, it's going to be a couple of months. You know, uh, Joseph, I do remember my elementary school social studies classes. One of the first things you learn about is the difference between the British system and the American one uh, that was established after our revolution against the British system. It seems like And I'm not trying to make this too simplistic, but you're right. Uh, The Trump legal team is blurring the line. Uh, They're relying on common law, carryover from British politics to American politics. But as the brief issued by the historians and the Brennan Center states, the founding generation sought to ensure that, unlike a king, the president would not acquire any special status that would carry forward after the end of his term. Instead, the president would be elected from the mass of the people and on the expiration of the time for which he is elected, return to the mass of the people again. So privileges, immunities, that is mm. the exact opposite of what our system is about. Notice that the Trump team not only claims that he had power as president, but he has power after the presidency, that he retains omniscient power. And the lower court ruled, and one of the judges there was saying, you mean that your client could order the execution of uh, Joe Biden and not be penalized? Well, yeah, you could also say if Trump doesn't like the decision by the Supreme Court, he can have them all arrested and executed. Now, I don't think they would want that. But so we know we know the justices are going to if they if they do what they did with the Colorado ballot case, they will dodge a lot of this history or maybe they won't. Maybe they'll engage with it. Something's going on inside the court that we don't know. There's a disagreement inside the court. What compromises they've made with each other. We will only find out down the road from a historical point of view to the extent that the Supreme Court endorses the principle that the lawyers for Trump have declared, it will go down as the worst decision in the history of the Supreme Court. If they don't do that and they find some way to finagle it, well, not finagle, I don't know. What they could do is kick it back to the judge in the January 6th case, which is a way of deferring it yet further. But I think that this this has broader implications too. If they do what they should do and rule that no, Donald Trump does not have the specific power that he is claiming. This has other, for example, if Donald Trump himself believes that he is above the law, Can he take the oath of office that if he wins the presidency that is required, it's written in the Constitution, to abide by the Constitution? If he believes he won't and he can't or he can stand above it, then I don't see how he can take the oath. Oh, he can. He can lie. But um, the second is there's an assumption that Trump and his team believe. Namely, if he can defer all of these criminal charges, especially this one, the January 6th trial, and win the presidency, he can pardon himself. If the court rules that he is not above the law, he can't pardon himself. No president in American history has tried to pardon himself. The pardoning power is vague. It just It's not clear. What I'm suggesting is that this decision will have implications not just about the specifics of of the case, but the larger issue of whether Trump, even if elected, can take office. 
I also think that it's in the interest of the American people in general, the voters who are going to make a decision in November. This includes people who intend to vote for Trump. If, in fact, they believe their man is innocent, then that verdict should have been arrived at prior to the election. If you are a person who doubts that, we should know that this man is going to be tried and, and probably convicted and in jail. The court, it seems to me, has a larger political responsibility to recognize that. And thus far, if you're looking at their way they've handled themselves, they have no sense of that or no interest in that. Well, they claim not to be political, which, of course, or some of them have. That's, of course, yeah, well, not, I think it's nonsense. Not just, it's not just political here. This is, uh, yeah, I, I hear you. I hear you. But what I'm saying is all of us who are intending to vote in this election, and I hope as many of people who can vote do vote, this is, again, the most important election of our lifetime, have a right to know whether or not this man is going to be convicted or tried and convicted of crimes. A decision not to allow us to know that is a decision at odds with the larger interest of the American people in general. Donald Trump deserves due process if a jury of his peers finds him not guilty for the charges related to the January 6th riot or insurrection. Fine. The issue here is whether he is immune from any charges based on this, well, wacky theory that his uh, legal team is pushing. You know, I I thought that this was already settled in 1974, (laughs) United States versus Nixon. Nixon had to comply with a criminal subpoena for the White House tapes. Now, And that was in Watergate. Now, later in 1982, Nixon did win a case that deals with uh, individuals being able to sue public officials like the president or a prosecutor or a police officer for screwing up their jobs, messing up an investigation, what have you. I think everyone agrees that if individuals can personally sue the president, he'd be sued constantly. So Nixon did win that case. But that was very, very limited definition of immunity. We're talking about the public nature of the office here and a public crime, and that's the 1974 decision where Nixon had a criminal subpoena for the White House tapes. Sorry to be going on here, uh, Joseph, but I I thought this was all handled during Watergate. But we can actually go back to uh, uh, not an abstraction, a real-life example from the early 1800s. President Jefferson, I know that you love Jefferson, uh, Joseph. Uh, (laughs) Well, I've I've written a book about him, yeah. yeah. He argued that he should have a special privilege to withhold evidence from the trial of Aaron Burr. What happened there? He was overruled by John Marshall, uh, who was the chief justice, who Jefferson hated him. And um, he was actually a cousin. And the chief justice ruled that essentially that the president's interference was interference and that he essentially ruled Burr innocent in this trial. But I think that there is no precedent in American history where a claim of being above the law has ever succeeded. And that's the reason that this is would be a precedent setting decision. And that's the court knows that the Supreme Court knows that. I think the Watergate decision is a clear indication because, in fact, the reason that his successor, whose name is escaping me, what's his successor's name? Gerald uh, Ford. The, Gerald Ford. Ford had to pardon him because otherwise he'd be charged. Pursuant to the pardon power conferred upon me by Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, have granted, and by these presents do grant, a full, free, and absolute pardon unto Richard Nixon for all offenses against the United States which he, Richard Nixon, has committed or may have committed or taken part in during the period from July 20, 1969 through August 9, 1974. Okay. There's a precedent there. This Supreme Court, however, is not impressed with precedents. In fact, many of them believe they're there to overturn precedents, including Roe v. Wade. But if they go over the line on this one, they are in 
Never, never land. Yeah, you know, and, I, I said to Jack Rakove that, you know, my problem with the modern presidency is that for quite a while now, the office, the executive branch has been accumulating too much power. We have the so-called imperial presidency and foreign policy, etc. But this is a, a leap that, uh, I mean, I told Jack, basically, we don't have a constitution anymore. We don't have... We don't have co-equal branches of government anymore. Here's from the brief uh, about Marshall overruling Jefferson. Marshall noted that unlike the king, who could do no wrong under English common law and therefore had discretion to withhold evidence from a court, such traditions had no place in the republic. Instead, there were many points of difference between the first magistrate in England and the first magistrate of the United States. Justice Marshall, the brief says, found no general immunity from providing evidence and instead held that the judicial branch must decide for itself whether a particular claim of privilege is warranted. You could search the historical record all day and not find anything in Trump's favor here when it comes to presidential immunity. The one you're picking is an excellent one, and I should have been able to remember it. It's been years since I worked on Jefferson, but yes, Jefferson also believed that the Constitution ought to be redone every 20 years because it needed to be uh, shaped in accord with altering uh, values. I mean, I think we need a major revision of the Constitution, and it's really tough to do that. And right now it's impossible to do that. But on this specific issue, the Supreme Court needs to clarify that no person is above the law. It's not just in the declaration in terms of an indictment of George III. It's also in the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And there's nobody above the law in that respect. Most aspiring dictators conceal from the voter what they're going to do if elected. Trump has not done that. And in some sense, his lawyers attempting to get him out of this one particular case have exposed the fact that if elected, he intends to function as a dictator. He says just for the first day. (laughs) Then he smiled. Yeah. Um, But this particular claim by his lawyers is an explicit statement of that. And he's made other claims. He's going to use his office to take revenge against his enemies. He's going to weaponize the Justice Department and the uh, other agencies he controls, including the military. This provides a real problem for the military. And I spent three years teaching at West Point, and I know those guys. They take an oath to the Constitution. And what happens if the commander in chief asks them to do something? Like, let's say, use the army to put down a protest against Trump's policies and gun them down if they have to. On the one hand, they're obliged to obey the command. On the other hand, that's an illegal order. And at Nuremberg, the court ruled that the Nazis who claimed to be obeying an order were still guilty. And those people up at West Point know that. We're setting up a real crisis here if Trump is elected on that particular issue. And the fact is that his trials have forced him to expose the fact that that's how he intends to function as a president. So when it comes to immunity or far from immunity, our founders also believe that not only are presidents not immune and did not have privileges, that they also could be prosecuted even while in office, or not just presidents, any executive, so governors. So when we talk a little bit about the revolutionary uh, state legislatures that were formed during the Revolutionary War, uh, they immediately started to amend or change their laws to hold the royal governors accountable, right? Yeah, right. And and most of the royal governors, once they were so identified, fled because they knew they were going to jail or worse than Virginia. They fled those ships off the coast because they were claiming to be the American representatives of a king and to possess similarly unlimited powers. A republic is by definition incompatible with anyone who claims to stand above the law. The word that most journalists are using to describe the threat that's facing us now is a threat to democracy. Throughout the American founding, from 1776 up to the election, really, of Andrew Jackson, the word democracy was an epithet. Democracy wasn't a good thing. It was a bad thing. What was democracy? Democracy was mob rule. Democracy was trusting in the people who at any given moment in time were not well-informed. Swoonish. They were swoonish. 
Yeah, and that's how we get that strange contraption called the Electoral College. And Madison's the one who makes this case in the convention. We can't have the voters in each state be the final determinant. You've got to filter their uninformed, usually misguided ideas through these more informed people whom we will name called electors. They thought they were then protecting the integrity of the election process. And I mean, they couldn't foresee things like all the modern technology that allows people to get the information they want to now. Of course. But the, the key word is republic, res publica, things of the public. The public is different from the people. The public is the long-term interest of the people, which at any given moment, most of the people don't comprehend. It's with Jackson that you move to a more democratic, populistic definition of government. But at the founding, they're very suspicious of that. Um, you know, Joseph, and- I, I need to do an episode at some point in the future. I can come up with the title right now. Republic and or democracy, question mark, Joseph Ellis versus Sean Wilentz. I would love it. Sean <laughs> and I are good friends and we don't agree on this. And uh, But it's a worthy argument to have and expose us to the dialogue. What both he and I feel strongly about is that we've lost the capacity to have a coherent and robust dialogue on these matters. The Constitution isn't a document of truths. It's a framework in which to argue about what the truths are. Argument itself is the answer. And programs like yours, and let's say a good session that I would have with him, would be a way of demonstrating that. Because these these aren't just abstractions. They're still relevant to to our everyday lives. Oh, yeah. I mean, the the decision that we face in November will move us one way or the other on this. That's fairly clear. And the one thing I would say to all of our listeners is, please, whatever else you do, vote. And vote for one of two people, Trump or Biden. All other votes are thrown away votes. And I don't like the way in which that's going to complicate the verdict that we eventually have as an American people. The number of people who vote in the United States in presidential elections is usually between 50 and 60 percent. That's one of the lowest in the world. The reason for that primarily, I think, isn't just disinterest. It's the Electoral College. Because if you live in California or, on the other hand, let's say Alabama, you can say, what difference does it make that I vote? Because we know my state's going to go yeah. blue or my state's going to go red. Now, it does have an impact on people lower down on the ballot. But also what's troubling me is that the education system has failed us. The legal system has failed us. With regard to the educational system, and I spent 45 years in teaching college, less than a third of the American people who are voting can pass the civics test required of new immigrants for citizenship. That didn't used to be the case. History enrollments are down throughout the United States. There's no quick way to repair that, but that it worries me that this republic is now going to be, the fate of it is going to be decided by people who are fundamentally uninformed mm. about what our republic really has been historically. So, so, Joseph, let me ask, though. So you're obviously not a fan of Donald Trump, and some of your comments here may rub some of his supporters the wrong way, what you just said about people being uninformed. Uh, have you received any negative feedback, uh, any backlash from your fans? Because everyone reads your books, doesn't matter what their politics are. But have any of your conservative readers expressed uh, unhappiness with your political views? Sure. I mean, I get emails from people. However, let, what I'm saying now, now let me be real clear. I am asking all people, regardless of who they vote for, whether it's Trump or Biden, to make that choice and vote. That I'm not telling the Trump voters not to vote or anything like that. They've got their convictions. I won't agree with them, but they have a right to express them. What I'm calling for is a significant increase in the turnout so that if this is the defining election of our lifetime and you care about your kids and your grandkids and what's going to happen in their world, you need to vote. 
You said uh, you receive emails. I have to challenge that, Joseph, because as you know, <laughs> you and George Washington have something in common. Neither ever learned how to use a computer. I write my books longhand. Yeah. You're right. But I've got an assistant that's been with me for 33 years. Oh, it boy. makes me appear to be digitally competent. Bless I've her. got a wife who, as you know, just put us on the air. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm not a person who likes to live in the uh, in that world, to be sure. But I don't want to wrap myself in any kind of uh, stupid splendor here. Um, <laughs> I'm not pleased with my digital incompetence, but it's the way I work. Well, that's okay. Robert Caro writes his books out longhand, and they are long books. So I'm going to yeah. uh, finish with a question. I stumped Jack Rakove with this trivia question. I'm going to see if I can stump you as well. Jack brought up Spiro Agnew in relation to this uh, discussion, and I said to him, so who are— Agnew was the second. Who was the first, the first vice president and the only other one to quit? Uh, boy, Jack is also a person I know, and his book on the Constitution is one of the better books on the Constitution. No question about that. He teaches at Stanford, yeah. and he does God's work because he exposes the law school people to some history. Um <laughs> I can't answer the question any better than he can, but it's somebody in the 19th century. Yeah. John C. Calhoun. He was Should have uh, got it. Jackson's, Should have got it. Yeah, the, the Jackson's vice president. Yeah, yeah, he stepped. That's right. And um, I'm a Southerner by birth. <laughs> I grew up in Virginia. I went to the College of William and Mary. Not while Jefferson attended. You were after him, but yes. Uh, he came a little before me, yes. although every desk has his initials and engraved in it. And Calhoun is one of the dominant forces in the greatest lie in American history. The greatest lie in American history is not that Trump himself won the election in 2020. That's a big lie, too. But the biggest lie in American history was that the Civil War was not about slavery. And that's what it was. And the Confederate flag this will alienate all of my deep Southern friends, is a statement that, you know, the no, it was about states' rights. Well, yeah, but the states' rights were about about slavery. It, and, was, it um, wasn't an accident that somebody brought the Confederate flag into the Capitol on January No, 6th. that's right. That's right. And I think that when you say you want to make America great again, how far back do you want to go? Mm. What does again mean to you? It's nebulous. I don't think it means they want to return to slavery. No, I mean, I think it does mean that we want to return to a day of white supremacy. It's a nebulous formulation. It's not about any specific year or era. In 1960, they gave a first year, they gave a national measure of the question, do you trust the government of the United States? 1960, 80% says yes. 20% says no. In 1975, same question, exact reversal. 20% say no, 80% say yes. So what's happened there? Well, you've got the Vietnam War, you've got Watergate, and three or four generations of Americans have grown up without presuming that they have any obligation to serve at all. And history and romance, as I said, are weighed down on that. And the current Congress of the United States is dysfunctional, especially the House. The Supreme Court is packed. Um, and so distrust of the government is not something that's totally irrational. But in my judgment, we're the second longest republic, nation-sized republic in world history. Number one is Rome. Rome lasted for almost 500 years. It ended when Caesar crossed the Rubicon in, what, 42 BC. We'll be crossing the Rubicon in this next election, one way or the other. Well, I can say presidential immunity, which we'll be talking about because that will be upcoming, is very, very important for a president to have. If a president doesn't have immunity, he really doesn't have a presidency. Uh, he can be, uh, he can be told to do things that he would never do. He can do really bad things for our country. Presidential immunity is imperative. It's going to be very, very important. And I'd rather talk about that next week. But there is nothing more important to a presidency than immunity, because they have to be free to make decisions without saying, oh, if I do this, or if I do that, as soon as I get out of office, we're going to be indicted. We're going to have trouble. And the other party will do that. I think we've seen that. They've done that. There's some very bad people. And you have an opposition party, and they will do things that are very bad. If you don't have immunity, you can be blackmailed. You can be, as a president, they'll say, if you don't do this, this, and this, we're going to indict you as soon as you leave office. You cannot allow a president to be out there without immunity. They don't have immunity. You don't have a presidency. So you lose all. Excuse me. President you lose all. You lose all form of 
of free thought and good thought. And you probably weaken the president to, to a point that it was never supposed to be weakened. It would be a very bad thing for our country. We'll be talking about immunity in the coming weeks. On the next episode of History As It Happens, supporters of the Palestinian cause are criticizing President Biden for not using U.S. leverage to try to stop Israel in its campaign in Gaza. We're going to talk about the last time an American president did that, and it might surprise you as to who it was. That's next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, For the ones who get it done.